Welcome to an Open Mat special. I'm Adam Catterall, on location, in his house, the one and only Mr. Nick Pete, and back at the Reptile Lair, probably doing more Lego. It is the one and only Mr. Dan Hardy. How are we, boys? We good? All good. What have we been doing since uh, we last caught up, obviously making our fantasy cards? I don't know if you saw that, boys, but got a bit of decent feedback on my old fantasy card, didn't I? You know what I mean? A lot of people buzzing for uh, Habib Connor too. just saying. There's an awful lot of Connor fans out there, that's why. <laughs> play into the play masses the, that's all you play want. to play the crowd the man play to the crowd i yeah. train ufc that's what i do dan <laughs> <laughs> uh, t- today's special is on the history of the strawweight division now i know a lot of people will be watching this going the history of the strawweight division it's only been going for five years but we thought we would give you a little bit of a chronological take uh, as to how we've managed to get to the point that we're at right now because i don't know if you feel like i feel the fight between Wei Li Zhang and Joanna Jędrzejczyk was absolutely outrageous. The greatest female fight of all time, and in my opinion, the greatest title fight of all time. Would you go along with that, Dan? Or have I maybe overdragged it a little bit? It's definitely up there. The thing with the thing with the Joanna against Zhang Wei Li fight, it, it wasn't it wasn't only the you know the amount of shots each of them threw and took. It was yeah. the, the the closeness of every single round. You could you know you could debate the fight over and over again, and they both gave everything they got. I mean, at the end of it, they were exhausted. They were beaten up. They couldn't have given anything more. So I think, I think as far as two competitors coming in absolutely ready and on their game for a t- world title fight, it's definitely the best. It was absolutely outrageous. Let's t- let's look at the history of it because a lot of people will always look back to Ronda Rousey as being the pioneer of uh, female mixed martial arts, especially in the world of uh, UFC. I remember that interview in 2012 that Dana White gave to the, that journalist and he was asked, when will we see females in the UFC? And he said, absolutely never. Fast forward 18 months and uh, Ronda Rousey's rocking and rolling, uh, fighting for a title. Nick, just talk to me about the importance of Rousey. And without her, would we have even have got a strawweight division or other divisions that we've had since? No, absolutely not. You know, Dana made it quite clear that he saw no value in putting females inside the octagon. Um, there was there really wasn't a big star out there. There certainly wasn't a strong enough field. As you say, Ronda Rousey came through and she was an absolute breakout superstar. You know, she had every single ingredient to become a superstar in this sport. And her run to become champion in another promotion led to Dana just saying, listen, we've got to get this girl in the UFC. We've got to capitalise on this moment in time right now where we've got this pioneer that can absolutely make the transition over to the octagon, bring all the fan base with her and generate the kind of interest she's doing with main, mainstream America initially. And obviously she just took over all around the world. So, you know, mm-hmm. right here, right now, 2020, would we have a women's division in the UFC by now if it wasn't for Ronda? Well, you would suggest that some of the girls that have come through, a couple of the girls we're going to spoke about tonight, but also the likes of Amanda Nunes and people like that, then yeah, you probably would have by now. Would it have happened when it did without Ronda Rousey? Categorically not. Nick, Nick, during that time, you were obviously editing one of the biggest mixed martial arts magazines in the world. Talk to me about when the UFC announced that they're going to introduce a strawweight division and they're going to do it through the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, well, it was the perfect way. And over the course of history, it's proven to us that tough is the best vehicle to introduce new weight classes and new superstars to this sport, certainly as far as the UFC is concerned. So it came as no surprise whatsoever. We'd already spoken at length about it. We'd looked at tons of fighters, uh, 115 pound and less all over the world and speculated about who may well be in the tough finale. So when it finally came together, you know, it was fans were quite looking forward to it. They were quite excited about this new talent pool of women, this whole new uh, collection of young fighters coming into the UFC just to see what level they were actually at because there was a whole, as I say, there's a whole pool of them. You know, there's, a, there's a, quite a few women's fight, women who were, 115 pound in other promotions outside of the UFC doing really well with title belts around their waist. It was inevitable they were going to come to the UFC and tough, the tough house was always the perfect vehicle for them. Don't know about you lads, but I always find it weird looking at Rose Namahunas with her. (laughs) (laughs) A lot's changed in that time, but obviously the first winner, uh, Rose didn't win that uh, bout. It was uh, Carla Esparza and a significant moment, Dan. Um, for this division because off the back of that then um, it again as you mentioned there started to inspire other girls to populate that division and we got to see some real talent coming through 
Well, this, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that this is really where the talent started to, to emerge. I mean, you know, Carla did a fantastic job of, of winning that season and, you know, a great performance against Rose, who gave a good account of herself as well. And, you know, we can see what she learned from that fight and uh, taking forward. But then, you know, when you saw Carla then face Joanna, it was like, ah, uh, okay, okay. This, Levels. This, now, we've, yeah, now we've found the champion of the division. I mean, the ultimate yep. fighter was really good at, at finding a person to put the belt around the waist, not to take anything away from Carla, but she was absolutely wrecked in this fight. I mean, this, this was a game changer in a lot of ways, I thought, not only because it was a, it was a, a, a brutal, it was a vicious performance from her. There was a lot of venom in her, in her strikes. There always is, which is one of the reasons why, you know, everyone always wants to watch Joanna fight. But it was the takedown defense with elbows that was the, the thing. I mean, that was, that was almost shocking at the time to watch because you could see how it was slowly breaking Carla Esparza. All of a sudden, we just saw that there was this, this whole new level of, of uh, strawway out there. And now we've got a, a new champion. And it was, who can we find to beat this girl? Because she, she brought a lot of excitement to a division where I would say Carla Esparza may not have had the same kind of uh, impact as a champion. She absolutely didn't. You know, she come through. Carla come through the tough period. And it was a fun tournament. It was fun. And we got this, you know, it was a good performance at the end against Rose. But she was a fun champion. She never really resonated with fans. We got through that that season, but no one really captured our attention. I thought Rose was probably one of the big stars to come out of that tough. But when Joanna took over and then Joanna started her reign, very much alongside Ronda Rousey as well, she was a bad girl. She was a badass. She was there to, you know, collect scouts. She was there to re as a wrecking machine. She wanted to finish girls. She wanted to beat girls up. She could rock the microphone. She really was the bad girl of this weight division. For me, that put it on the map with fans more than anything. Joanna had come through and you're like, wow, this girl from Poland is one mean and she's just gonna keep hammering people. And she was, it was just like challenger after challenger after challenger. Yes, there was a lot of points decisions in there, but nobody had an easy ride with Joanna. And for the time you thought, is this gonna go like the men's flyweight division? Is she just gonna dominate and, and be champion forever? Obviously that wouldn't happen eventually, but that reign of Joanna, I just want to take yeah. note to highlight what a brilliant time for the sport that was. And certainly in, in the career of Joanna champion. Are you going to apologise to me then? Because you know that I love her and you've always given me abuse for jumping on the Joanna bandwagon. This is, that, that's no. the reason. Everything you've just said there was that. That's the reason why I love her. But then I come back to where the first was. <laughs> Rose was the star of Tough for me. Ah, there we go. And Rose there we to go. come back the way she did and, you know, to, to bounce back from losing the Tough finale, to, to play a bit of a backseat while Joanna goes on this incredible tear. And listen, I remember going into that first fight with Rose. Listen, she had the badass haircut, everything else. But still, we remembered her from Tough. We remembered how softly spoken she was, the troubled yeah. background she was. You know, basically in the shadow of Pat Barry, her partner. Is, you know, she's never going to live with Joanna. She's not going to be tough enough. And what a performance. For me, still the best performance individually by any girl in this weight division. That first fight against Joanna to stop her the way she did, to beat her up at her own game. Dan Hardy, come on, son. That's what we live for. What a <laughs> performance from Rose that was. Yeah, it was. And I think she set it up really well as well. And, you know, in the build-up, the way that she dealt with the psychological games of Joanna. Because, I mean, that, that was something that we all enjoyed in the build-up to, to her fights. It was something we expected. The face-off at the weigh-ins, the face-off in the octagon. And, and Rose, Rose, it was almost like she had a plan of how to deal with it, to, to yep. maintain her calm, to maintain her cool, to not get rattled by it. And she just she stayed in the zone, as you said. Joanna was the was is the bad girl of the division, and I think in a lot of ways she legitimised the belt by the way that she fought. Like all of a sudden, people are people are looking at her thinking this, like she could dominate this division for a long, long time. Like yeah. she's a legitimate world champion. But then you always need the antithesis of of a world champion, which I think yeah. is Rose, someone that stays calm, that is you know that isn't. Like psychologically imposing, you could say, as as uh, as Joanna. I mean, mm. like Joanna was always about getting inside people's heads and always about talking them out of the fight before the fight had started. And Rose was silent. Was she, you know, uh, saying the Lord's Prayer during the face-offs at the weigh-ins or something? It, you know, mm. it's just a completely different approach. And I think that I think the the opposing character did a lot of favors for Joanna as well. The division really has developed in such a short period of time. I know it's only been going for five years, 
But even just over the last two years, since 2017, it's come on leaps and bounds, Dan. It, it has. And I think, you know, this is something that we see if, if you look back into the history of, of the UFC. There are so many developments in, in the sport. And one thing that we see when we have a division that's kind of locked down for a while with the champion is that the division feels like it's gotten a little stagnant because the, the, the champions, the, the challenges that are coming up to the champion, we kind of know that they're not quite ready or, yeah. you know, not going to be good enough to beat them. But then there's always that one person that turns the corner. And that one person that turns the corner kind of unlocks a door to all of these other contenders that have now raised their game because the champion was so good. Yes. Like, you, you know, we can say the same thing about um, about Ronda and the, and the bantamweight division. Like, you know, when she was the champion, it was like, well, who's going to beat her? Everyone's going to get on board in the first minute. But then there's one person that changes the course of, of the division. That was uh, yes. Holly Holm. Then that allows Misha to get back in. But Misha's game had been raised because Ronda was so was so good and so dominant. So yeah. like what Joanna did in, in that time where she was dominating the division is she forced every other straw way out there with title aspirations to step their game up. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that that's what we saw from that's what we saw from Andrade, that's what we saw from from Rose. Rose played that role where it was that's kind it. of like um Chris Weidman at middleweight. Chris Weidman beating Anderson Silver at middleweight, ending this legacy reign that he had. You never thought Chris Whiteman was then going to be go and be champion for ten years. He just stopped it. He just ended that reign, and you thought, "Wow, the cat's amongst the pigeons now. Anything can happen." And it felt like that at strawweight. Once Joanna yeah. got beat, once Rose won, I remember saying to I remember saying to you, Adam, and speaking to everybody, saying, "Rose Nami Eunice, as much a bigger fan as I am, she's not going to be champion for long. Her role in history was stopping Joanna's reign, default that reign, and then she goes in straight next fight, loses to Andrade." And the title gets gets rolls on again. So um, th I think that's also part of the reason why there's been so much interest in the female strike strawweight division. You know, a lot of fans globally have lost interest in the men's flyweight division because Demetrius Johnson's reign was there so long. He beats everybody through the card, not just once, but some of them multiple times. And people just lost interest. And it's hard to keep interested in the minimum weight to look at boxing. Flyweight boxers don't earn anywhere near the kind of money people earn from middleweight and above. And it's similar with MMA as well. You've got to keep the interest going. And it's testament to the quality of this female strawweight field that every time they announce a fight, we're fascinated. We can't wait for it. And as we got recently, one of the fights, one of the best fights of all time, when the story belt was up for grabs. Well, we'll talk to me, Dan, about the current champion because this girl, obviously, dedicated her life to mixed martial arts in China. She's been working a lot out of the PI in Las Vegas, and she's put in some sensational victories. Obviously, beating Andrade in the way that she did in her, uh, in front of her home fans, absolutely smashed the champion, became champion herself, and then put on. As Nick was just saying, there one of the greatest fights that we've we've ever seen in a, in, in a title clash with Joanna. I think what uh, what Zhang Weili did was she was able to kind of find the middle ground between Jessica Andrade and, and Joanna. You know, if if you look at Joanna, she's high output but but relatively low power. She's not stopping people with one shot. Jessica Andrade on the other end is just power. She, I mean, her nickname is literally Pile Driver. She is, <laughs> she is a powerhouse. She wants to pick people up, slam them. She wants to come forward with wrecking powerful hooks, quite reckless, but very, very power based. Then you look at Zhang Wei Li, and she's kind of halfway between the two. She's got the technique and the output. She's a crisp striker. She's got good grappling skills, but she can also work at a, a, a decent rate. And she's got power, as we saw in the Andrade fight. I actually expected her to weather an early storm in, in the fight against Andrade and then start coming on in the second, third and fourth and, and you know either stop her late or win by points. The fact that she came in and blasted her out of the water really opened my eyes up to the fact that she's kind of united the, the, the pace with power. And, yeah. I mean, she's the kind of person that can hold a division down for a while. It's the same, yeah. as, same as Shevchenko, which is why you know on my fantasy card, I wanted to see these two face off. I don't know about you lads, but... The, the title fight that we got at 248 between uh, Zhang and Joanna was, was the pinnacle for me of mixed martial arts. It was absolutely outstanding. I remember watching that 25 minutes with my mouth wide open, just thinking to myself, one, these girls are absolutely nails, tough as they come, the toughest that I've seen. But it was the technicalities and the speed that they were throwing things at, you know? Zhang would do something, then it'd be an instant response from Joanna. Then Joanna would do something, instant response from Zhang. And of course, we saw uh, the state that Joanna left the octagon in. Yang obviously hits very, very hard, but 
the technicalities, Dan, of that fight was just off the chart. It, it was, and that, you know, and that's something that I think when Joanna was was champion, I think it was difficult to to anticipate there'd be another person somewhere on the planet that would be able to go punch for punch, kick for kick with her. Um, I mean, you know, it's these kind of fights where they are, they're razor thin. It was so competitive. I mean, we're talking down to a, a few strikes per round and whether you score volume over impact or, you know, whatever it is, visible damage over octagon control and however the judges are seeing it. Like, you could you could debate each round in lots of different ways. And they've, they've really set know, a bar, though. They, these two have really set it, a bar, yeah. though, now, haven't they? I mean, every, they have. you know, fights going forward in the strawweight division now to compete for the title, of course, they're not always going to play out like that because people bring different attributes to, to, to the fight. But fans are going to demand this. Fans are looking at that now going, right, okay, that's the benchmark. We, we need to see this more often. Yeah, but what, what we saw in that fight, you said, you said you know, raise the bar. They've set the, they've set the mark much higher. They did that during the fight for each other. You know, it's <laughs> like each round, they had to go back to their stall and think, okay, how can I be better this next round? Because it was, they must have known how close the fight was. They must, I mean, they both had their hands up at the end when they were, when they were re reading the, uh, the, the scorecards. I'm sure they both felt like they were they were edging rounds or losing rounds by by a few punches during the fight. So they were constantly having to dig deeper as well. And then you've got to think like, if I'm watching that fight and I'm a straw weight contender, I'm thinking to myself, when this when this fight's over, I need to get out and do some road work or just some shadow boxing. Or something. Like that that's the kind of fight that makes everybody step their game up and and you know gets them into the gyms on Monday morning trying to make a make an improvement to their game. That's what gets us excited, though, Nick, isn't it? That's what gets us all excited about that that development. Absolutely. From a fan's perspective, as you say, the bar has been raised. Suddenly this weight division is no longer the weight division where the belts are moving around, where there's this star or that star. Suddenly it's the weight division that is delivering, that is delivering top class MMA, not just by very technical fighters, but also fighters who are brave, tough, willing to go to the well. You know, these, are, these are the type of fights where... People leave a piece of them inside the octagon. You don't have these fights many times in your career. You can't go to the well every time like this unless you're someone mental like Chris Lieben. You, you know, you, these are the big title fights. This is the moment you say before. This is why you don't spar 100 miles an hour. This is why you don't fight every other week because you need to be ready for moments like this, gut check moments, when you're standing across the octagon or the ring from someone that is absolutely equally matched to you. You're at your very best. Well, guess what? She's at her very best as well. Now it, come, it doesn't come down to technique no more. It doesn't come down to who you can get the best combination of or what team, uh, what team can motivate them best between rounds. This is about who wants it most. And they're always the greatest fights. Both of them, again, I maintain it. Both of them beat any other soul weight in the world that night. This night, Either arm could have been raised. They were both absolutely, truly sensational. We will get to see it again. Hopefully we don't get to see it next. I don't think we need to see it next. We will get to see it again. But I tell you what, this fight will go down in history as one of the greatest 25 minutes in the sport, period, regardless of men or women. Top stuff. Gents, absolute pleasure going through that. For everybody watching this at home, don't be frightened of leaving uh, a few things in the comments of maybe specials that you'd like us to do. Whilst we're all on lockdown, we're looking forward to making some new stuff for you here at BT Sports. If there's something that you want us to look into from the history of UFC to maybe top 10s, then fire them in and we'll try and get them made with our fantastic production team. Until that, make sure you subscribe to the channel and keep checking us out here on BT Sport. Yeah.